The cop showed up. I tried to keep my cool. Gave him a license and insurance, and he came up to me. And he says, I'm sorry, Mr. Hahn, but you have a warrant out for arrest. And I'm like, for what? He said, a bad check. I go, really, how much? $16.83. <laughs> Think somebody's trying to get my attention here? I'm like, you know, want to know what it was for? Chinese food. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm the smart guy this morning, right? $16.83. They take me to jail. I bond out of jail. I run for my problems from Kansas City, Missouri to Joplin, Missouri. Uh, not willing to face any of my issues head on. Uh, when I got to Joplin, the same people that were in Kansas City were in Joplin. They just had different faces and different names waiting for me. I get to Joplin. A year goes by. I have to face some of my charges. And, and I really love this picture. You see this picture? I, I get this, this sense this judge is looking through all these papers. And I'm like, what's that guy looking at? And then he asked me, Mr. Hahn, do you want to know what I'm looking at? I go, yeah, I do, Your Honor. He goes, these are all the misdemeanor charges that you've covered up for the past several years. Like, oh, no. Because I... I made it quite a habit of covering things up, having to reduce the other charges, but that judge could see what the original charges were. So I stood before him facing a felony charge of possession. He said, I'm going to give you a good deal today. Uh, as you can see, he gave me three years probation with SIS probation, one year backup in the Missouri Department of Correction. Now, he gave me 30 days shock time. He granted me work release with the shock time in county jail. Here's in layman's terms, Okay. Go do your probation. Don't get in trouble for three years. Go to county jail and sleep. And you don't have anything on your record. That's a sweetheart. They don't give those deals out anymore because I think me. <laughs> Took me two weeks to mess it up. I went back to the jail high and drunk. Two weeks later, they locked me down. Um, of course, work doesn't except collect phone calls at the radio station. So I get out. You can imagine that, right? So I, I lose my job. I, I run from my problems again to Fayetteville, Arkansas. Now I'm in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I'm trying to grasp onto any sense of, uh, of control. I'm still uh, in control of things. There's just a couple speed bumps in the road. But I still had a grasp on that I was in control. And I got a job at the number two largest media company in the world called Cumulus Broadcasting, Power 105.7. Still trying to show people that I had some sense of control. So I was there about a year. My addiction spiraled greatly out of control. I, I pretty much lost all sense of reality at this point. Wasn't going to work hardly ever on time. And they came up to me and said, Joe, we love you. you got a great personality, but you, you just don't come to work. And I said, you know, at this point, I really didn't care. I wanted to pursue my criminal lifestyle. Then I ran into a buddy um, from high school. And this buddy from high school um, introduced me to meth, asked me if I knew anything about it. And I said, no, I don't know a lot about it. And I looked at it as a lucrative business opportunity. At this point, we got immersed into uh, methamphetamines in Northwest Arkansas. Now, the thing I'm fixing to tell you, I'm not going to glorify anything, but I want to make a very uh, a good example about it. In Northwest Arkansas, we got involved with a particular organization. This organization was called the Serenium Stray Sage MS-13, or CERB. 13. Are you guys familiar with that name? Have you ever watched a history channel or, or, or gangland? They're one of the largest Hispanic gangs in the United States currently. Now, I'm not saying I was one of them or affiliated, but we did run in the same circles. And I tell you this because um, if you have to act according to the rules, um, if you guys go to church or you go to work or, or whatever the case may be, you have to act according to the rules of that place, right? There's repercussions if you don't. Same thing with this particular organization. I found myself in a situation one night. I had to act according to their rules. And I caught seven felony charges. Five of them were violent. Do you want to take a guess on how long it had been on a three-year probation? Six what? Months? How about two years and nine months? 90 days short of having nothing on my criminal record. I went back before the judge and he said very simply this, Mr. Hahn, you're going to do your time. I looked at my attorney, I looked at the prosecutor, they said, don't worry, you're going to do about 60 days and you'll be out. But that's not in fact what happened. I went to prison and I did time in a level five facility, 23 hours a day, locked down. I did about five and a half months there, 15 minutes out in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening. Every other movement is controlled by guards. And this is a culture shock to say the least uh, from a 1900 person town in Anderson, Missouri. Um, I, I was a little bit out of my element. But nonetheless, I bonded out or paroled out of there back to uh, Washington County and Fayetteville, Arkansas. Still have the seven felony charges to answer for. Now, when I went back to Washington County, I, my bond was reinstated. And I had about four months that I had to go back to court. And before I went back to court, I started acting like a big dummy. I used drugs intravenously. I stole. I hurt. I lied. Specifically, my family and my parents. The people that really supported me and loved me the most. I hurt them really bad. 
So during this time, I uh, I was doing these things. I had to go back to court. And I remember that day. It was, it was just a few days before my parole ran out in Missouri. And I sat outside the courtroom, and the attorney came out. And I, I'm not going to tell you the charges today because they're really irrelevant, but I'll tell you this. I hired a federal attorney because I did not know the way the charges would go. And then so he came out to me, and he says, Joe, we have to either take it to uh, trial or we have to take a plea bargain today. And, of course, in my mind, we're taking it to trial, baby. I just paid you a lot of money. We're going to fight and that's what I told him. I go, let's take it to trial, John. We can do it. He goes, Joe, if we take it to trial, we're pushing for 50 years. I was like, um, what's option number two? <laughs> Let me tell you, this. that was in 2007. We're 2012. We're not even five years into a 50-year sentence. And by the grace today, I stand before you. And we're going to get to more of that here in a minute, okay? So I take option number two. They give me 10 years, suspend eight. I have to do two locked up, one of which has to be long-term treatment. Now, I get to this long-term treatment program, this 12-step recovery. Have you guys ever heard of these things? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought I was the cutest smart aleck there ever was. And we were in an orientation room about this size when I got to Texarkana, Arkansas. And they said, you have to read the first, you have to work the first three steps. And of course, they asked for a volunteer to read those steps. I'm like, oh, pick me, pick me, pick me. And they go, read number, read number one. So I turn around and I look at an old wall. It was painted on the wall. We didn't have a screen like this. And we admitted we were powerless over our addiction that our lives would become unmanageable. And here's me. Hello, I'm managing things so well, I'm in prison. Read number two, smart guy. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Hello, my sane choices got me here. What else do you got? Then I read number three. I struggled with this one quite a bit. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. There was a, some, God messed up way long ago. I was born in the wrong family, didn't have the clothes or the shoes and things that I wanted. Remember that? There was a mess up in the divine plan, so absolutely I'm not going to turn my life. I don't even know if he's real. I faked it for the whole year. 72 hours after I got out, I was using drugs again. Nine months later, I was back in jail. And then I was in and out, in and out of county and city jail up until March 5th, 2008. Now, March 5th, 2008, I have to set the stage for you. I'm facing felony conviction five, six, and seven. I'm back in jail again, facing my third prison term. In two different states. I had seven DWI charges on my record, ten possession charges, and I'm back in county jail again. So I'm back in county jail. And up until March 5th, 2008, it brings me closer to May 28th, 2008, around 9.30, 9.35 p.m. Now I have to set the, set the stage for you. You see this jail cell right here. This is a... This is a solitary confinement jail cell. I found myself in one of these. This is how brilliant I was. I couldn't act according to the rules of jail. So they put me in a small 8 by 10 jail by myself. Did you hear me? I didn't act according to the rules of jail. I thought I had it all figured out. So during this time, 9.30 p.m., I got one hour out a day. I called my father and my father says, Joe, I have to tell you something that you don't want to hear. My 11-year-old little niece, she's 13 going on 14. I love her to death. She's awesome. But she asked my father, and my father asked me this question and told me, Cameron wants to know what she had done wrong that you don't want to stay home with her on her birthday. Yeah. My heart broke. I did not know what to do. I told my dad very quickly, Dad, i got to go. He goes, I understand. You know, at this point, I realized for the first time in my life, what had I done? Why would that little girl think that she'd ever done anything wrong? For the first time in my life, I realized that my choices affected other people. I was a very selfish individual. And that little 11-year-old girl brought me to my knees that night. I asked God into my heart, asking to forgive me and asking to help. I said very simply, please help me. And I believe there was some redemption that next morning. The sergeant that brought me into that cell said, you'll never get out of this jail cell until you go back to the DOC. He stood in my jail cell 5 a.m. the next morning. He says, I don't know why, but I'm putting you back in to general population pond. I was very thankful. I looked at the ceiling and I said, you're amazing. And very quickly, I was, I was shipped back to the Missouri Department of Corrections. Now, a lot of my story, I have a very close connection with my higher power. I like to call him God. Uh, but at this time, a spiritual war started in my life that I did not know was going to. It's like I switched teams. Devil was mad. 
Because that Swift team and God said he was serious last night. He really wants to change. I love this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures I have on my slide. The spiritual war begins. But I was serious that night. I wanted to change. I wanted something different. And I knew that I had made a good decision. Even though I stood before a judge and a judge asked me for four, gave me, asked, he said he'd give me three years, I asked him for four. And he asked me, why do you want four years? And I said, well, there's this long-term treatment thing that I really think I need to finish. In order to go to long-term treatment in the state of Missouri, I have to have a four-year sentence. And I've got to finish this step three that I kind of fudged on a year or two ago. And he said, do you realize you're going to do more time? And I said, you know, it's not about doing the time. It's about doing the right thing for once. And I mean, my attorney was flipping out, the prosecutor's flipping out, and all I can remember is that big old judge, his name was Judge Daly, and he looked at me and he smiled, a smile I'll never forget, and he goes, Mr. Hahn, I don't understand it, but I respect your decision. You've got your four years, and I wish you the best of luck. And so I was shipped off to the DOC, and you can see the internal conflict that I was feeling uh, had to do with, you know, switching teams and... I just added seven and a half months to my sentence because I felt like it was the right thing to do. But I knew that I made a good decision when I got to Fort Lee, Missouri and Ozark Correctional Center. And when I was there, I was in a safe place. I got to concentrate on me 